Tonight, no way out. Palestinians scramble from artillery fire as Israel launches lethal strikes on the region's largest functioning hospital. Pressure mounts on Israel as global leaders ask where the nation draws the line. Farmers unite. India and Italy see waves of protest across its regions as farmers continue to fight for their rights. Talks show hopeful signs of a compromise. Trump in trouble. The New York judiciary say no to Trump's plea as Trump's legal dilemmas continue to swamp his political campaign. Despite this, Haley struggles to catch up. And hello, Sora. OpenAI takes the tech world by storm with a revolutionary text-to-video feature, making magic out of thin air. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You are joining us on World News on our final bulletin to close off this week. This Friday has seen some eventful updates to key stories we were following over the week. We start off tonight with new information on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Israeli forces say they have raided the biggest functioning hospital in Gaza as footage showed chaos, shouting and gunfire in dark corridors filled with dust and smoke. Israeli forces ordered people to evacuate the hospital before the strikes began. A stream of Palestinians, some injured, some patients and others sheltering at Nasser was on the road to the southern border city of Rafah. Tonight, smoke and chaos filling the hallways of Nasser Hospital, the largest medical facility still functioning in Gaza, as Israeli troops mounted a raid in search of Hamas operatives. Israel army trying to enter Nasser Hospital now. Israeli special forces storming inside in the early hours of the morning. Terrified staff navigating the wards by the light of cell phones, trying to get patients to safety. In this section, part of the ceiling collapsed from what witnesses say was a direct Israeli strike. By Israeli this is Dr. Mohammed Harara, who works in the emergency room, as night after night he's treated a flood of the wounded. He stayed at the hospital even as Israel ordered displaced people to evacuate. This morning, he finally left. But hours later, he was back at work in another overwhelmed ER, this time in the city of Rafa. We operate against Hamas terrorists wherever they are hiding. Last month, a former hostage told the Associated Press that Hamas held her and over two dozen hostages inside Nasser Hospital. Israel says hostages' bodies may still be there. While in Tel Aviv, fury over Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's decision to pull out of hostage talks in Cairo. Netanyahu called Hamas's demands delusional. Senior Japanese economists said the depreciation of the yen and the economic downturn, which besieged many domestic enterprises, are the main reasons why Japan's 2023 GDP has dropped to the fourth place in the world. Citing government data, national news agencies reported that Japan lost its world's third largest economy status to Germany as its gross domestic product in 2023 in normal terms and unadjusted for inflation stood at 591.48 trillion yen. Less than the size of the German economy, which totaled to $4.46 trillion. But it seems it's not a completely negative situation over in the land of the rising sun. For analysis on this and updates, we have other than a World News special correspondent Rasita Chandodasa from Tokyo in Japan. Rasita. Hi, Anuradi. The Japanese economic data came yesterday as a big surprise for the markets. The Japanese real GDP, which is the actual nominal GDP minus inflation, was the, the quarter, the third quarter one was uh, was 0.4 percent dip compared to the YUI, the last quarter. So this result was mainly due to the uh, expenditures like a higher import cost and the li lack of public spending. And some media, especially Western media, call this as a recession. Look, the exports are extremely high and the companies are making record profits and the Japanese government is spending massively on their capex. So this is anything but a recession. But again, why this has happened? I mean, the two main reasons were the imports. The high import cost was due to the weaker yen, which has gone really down up against both yen, pound and the euro. And also the public spending 
less public spending is due to the inflation, although which is not a big issue compared to the Western nations and other countries, still it's a little issue, it's, it's an issue in Japan. So people are worried about that. But how the market reacted, this is very interesting. Even today, the market, the Nikkei average went up and it is aging closer to the, the biggest rally, the, the highest rally they had in 1989. That was the peak of the bubble. And Toyota just recently surprised NTT as the biggest company ever in Japan. So the markets are kind of acting not correctly to these reports, which means the, the fundamentals are solid, exports are growing, and the companies are making record profits. But again, the weaker yen plus the, uh, the lack of public expenditure is a big concern for the Japanese government. Over to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world special correspondent, Rasata Chandradasa from Tokyo in Japan. Now, the acting chairman of former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan's PTI party that the jailed leader had nominated Omar Ayub Khan as a candidate in a parliamentary vote to elect a new premier following last week's national elections. Ayub is actually currently in hiding and is wanted in various investigations by law enforcement, including charges of being a part of rioting that followed Imran Khan's arrest. The polls did not return a clear majority for anyone, but independent candidates backed by Khan won 92 out of 264 seats, making them the largest group. Khan ruled out alliances with the three largest parties, which means his candidate currently lacks the numbers to form government. Khan supporters ran as independents because they were barred by election commissions on technical grounds from contesting the polls under his party's electoral symbol. Despite the ban and Khan's imprisonment for convictions on charges ranging from leaking state secrets to corruption, millions of former cricketers' supporters came out to vote for him, even though he cannot be part of any government while he remains in prison. Currently, the two main rivals appear on course to take control after they formed a coalition. Nawaz Sharif's Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz and Bilal Bhutto Zadari's Pakistan People's Party. Members of Pakistan's National Assembly will elect the new Prime Minister and 56-year-old Mr. Ayub will face off against the PMLN's Shabazz Sharif, Nawaz Sharif's brother. Mr. Ayub's criminal charges do not disqualify him from seeking the PM post. If elected PM, Mr. Ayub said his top priority is to free political prisoners. He won last week as an independent backed by PTI. He is the grandson of Muhammad Ayub Khan, a military dictator and Pakistan's president from 1958 to 1969. The vote for Pakistan's next Prime Minister will take place after all new members of the National Assembly take their oaths and the Speaker and Deputy Speaker have been elected. Indian farmers continued pressing for higher prices for their crops and vowed to continue protesting until their demands are met by the government. The farmers have postponed a planned march to New Delhi, however, until farmers' unions hold another round of talks with government ministers scheduled for Sunday. Thousands of farmers had embarked on the Delhi Cholo or Let's Go to Delhi march earlier this week to press the government to set a minimum price for their produce, but were stopped by security forces about 200 kilometers away from the capital, triggering clashes. The farmers remained camped on the border between Punjab and Haryana states today. Security forces have used concrete and metal barricades as well as drones carrying tear gas canisters to stop them from advancing. The protest comes two years after Modi's government, following a similar protest movement, repealed some farm laws and promised to find ways to ensure support prices for all produce. Italian farmers have also continued to organize protests across the country to oppose European Union's agricultural policies, demanding the EU and the Italian government to respond to their life and production difficulties. Thousands of farmers from all over Italy and even some government officials from agricultural regions marched in Rome to demonstrate against the EU's new environmental policies and the EU's large-scale import of agricultural products from outside. This is also the first time that Italian farmers have demonstrated in downtown Rome since this round of protests broke out. However, only a small number of tractors are allowed into the city according to police requirements. 
Not one, but three rallies were staged by Italian farmers in Rome on Thursday. Over a thousand of them flocked to the Italian capital from across the country. The CRA group was the main organizer of the protest. They don't identify with any unions and are against Brussels rule. They traveled to the Italian capital to deliver their message to the European Commission. Others instead decided to gather outside the mayor's office. Later in the afternoon, hundreds of protesters and their trucks gathered in Rome's Circo Massimo for the day's final act. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with updates on key stories in the US and much more. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The motorcade of Donald Trump was seen driving off after the former U.S. president lost his bid to get his hush money case dismissed. As a result, Trump will become the first former U.S. president to stand trial on criminal charges after a New York judge denied his request to dismiss an indictment stemming from hush money paid to a porn star and set a March 25th trial date. The case that first made Donald Trump a criminal defendant, now the first to go to trial. A judge in Manhattan today rejecting Mr. Trump's bid to toss the case out, saying the trial will begin on March 25th. Sitting in court today by choice, the Republican frontrunner will soon be required to show up. The judge saying he expects the trial to last six weeks, a distraction, Mr. Trump argues, is aimed at trying to derail his presidential campaign. It's a very unfair situation. They want to keep me nice and busy so I can't campaign so hard. The judge today unpersuaded by Mr. Trump's defense team arguing they cannot adequately prepare for the trial in New York with all his other criminal cases still on the horizon, including a Florida trial over classified documents in May and his election interference case in Washington, still unscheduled. The crux of the case in Manhattan, accusations of hush money paid to a porn star ahead of the 2016 election, falsely documented, prosecutors say, as a legal expense on the books of the Trump Organization to hide it. Now on the road to the White House, former U.S. President Donald Trump continues to have his time in the spotlight as he reacted to Russian President Vladimir Putin's remarks that he prefers incumbent President Joe Biden over the Republican frontrunner in the 2024 elections. Speaking at a campaign rally in North Charleston, South Carolina, Trump said President Putin of Russia has just given him a great compliment. Meanwhile, presidential candidate Nikki Haley pitched herself in Texas as the one to spearhead a new conservative movement as she wages her long-shot bid to deny Donald Trump the GOP nomination for president. Trump's detractors charged the former president with having a bias towards supporting Putin. A U.S. intelligence report that claimed Russia had meddled in the 2016 presidential election to aid Trump in defeating Hillary Clinton has clouded his years in office. Trump has recently lobbied Republican members to vote against the Senate's $95.34 billion military aid proposal. Meanwhile, Haley stopped in Dallas as a part of a two-day fundraising swing through Texas with additional stops in Houston and San Antonio, hosted by some of the state's most prominent and deep-pocketed GOP donors. Haley has set her sights on states like Texas with open primaries, meaning that any voter can cast a ballot regardless of their party affiliation, as a possible path to gain an edge on Trump after losses in Iowa, New Hampshire and Nevada. In Texas, Haley faces an immensely steep climb. Though many of the state's top Republicans has once entertained an alternative to Trump, they have now largely consolidated around the former president. On top of that, Haley's open targeting of Texas because of its open primary accelerated chatter of closing the state's Republican primary among GOP activists already fretting about Democrats' ability to vote in the election. Haley trailed Trump in Texas by more than 60 percentage points in a University of Houston poll. 
Now, U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson said after a briefing by White House officials on a Russia-related national security threat that it was a very serious matter and needed to be addressed immediately. Johnson spoke after a briefing on Capitol Hill by White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and other officials about Russia developing an anti-satellite capability. According to the officials, Russia is making progress towards developing a nuclear-fueled space asset that could block communications and other signals here on Earth. Tonight, the White House confirmed that it's monitoring Russia's development of what it called a troubling anti-satellite capability, but cautioned it is not a threat to Americans. We are not talking about a weapon that can be used to attack human beings or cause physical destruction here on Earth. And tonight, details about that capability, that it's a Russian nuclear-powered space asset that could be weaponized, according to a U.S. official and a congressional official familiar with the intelligence. It is not a nuclear bomb that Russia is trying to send up in space. Not an active capability, and it has not yet been deployed. Experts have said a nuclear-fueled satellite might be able to carry a high-powered jammer that could block out a wide array of communications and other signals. Today's revelations come just hours after the House Intelligence Committee chairman, Republican Mike Turner, issued a cryptic warning demanding the White House declassify intelligence about the unspecified threat. And today the White House met with House leaders about it. I've got great faith in uh, what the administration is currently doing to address this matter. We don't want there to be a war in space, but if others choose to uh, start a war there, we'll be ready. Russia and Ukraine exchanged air attacks with Moscow targeting cities across Ukraine and Kyiv striking the Russian border city of Belgorod one day after Kyiv said it sank another Russian warship off the coast of Crimea. At least seven people were reported injured after attacks on Kyiv, Lviv and the eastern city of Zaporizhia and infrastructure facilities were damaged in a string of attacks launched by Russia. For more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk, Russia. Minoli. Yes, Anuradi. Hours later, Russian authorities said five people were killed and eight injured in a missile strike on the Russian city of Belgorod. The regional governor also said that seven homes were damaged. The U.S. has warned that Russia could seize Ukraine's key eastern town of Avdivka, the scene of some of the fiercest fighting in recent months. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby reported the warning citing Ukraine's ammunition shortages. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky vowed to do everything to save as many Ukrainian lives as possible. Russian troops have made gains in Avdivka, threatening to encircle it. The latest series of strikes follows the damage to Russia's landing ship, Caesar Kunikov, which was attacked with V-5 drones. Russia has not disclosed if there were any casualties in that attack. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. The North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong, says Pyongyang is open to softening its relations with Tokyo, including inviting the Japanese leader to the north. The rare offer is seen as a way of holding South Korea in check against its recent forging of diplomatic ties with the north's long friend, Cuba. According to the regime's state-run Korean Central News Agency on Thursday, Kim said that Pyongyang and Tokyo can open a new future together if Japan makes a political decision to improve relations. The remarks came after Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida last week said that he feels a strong need to change the current relations between the two sides and that related activities are currently taking place. Kishida last May had also expressed a desire to meet with Kim Jong-un. Kim Yo-jong added that Kishida's visit to North Korea might happen on the condition that Japan is willing to leave the past abduction of Japanese citizens off the table. Relations between Pyongyang and Tokyo have long been sour, as Japan claims that 17 of its citizens were abducted by North Korea in the 1970s and 80s, and that 12 still remain in the North. North Korea argues that the issue has already been settled, saying that eight have died and the remaining four were never kidnapped. Experts say the remarks could be intended to counter South Korea's recent establishment of diplomatic ties with Cuba, a longtime ally of North Korea. Seeking cooperation with Japan could provide North Korea with a breakthrough, as its diplomatic isolation in the international community is becoming increasingly severe. 
I believe the North intends to counter the establishment of diplomatic relations between South Korea and Cuba with a cooperative relationship with Japan, while strengthening the hostile relationship with South Korea. Kim Yo-jong, however, stressed that her remarks were solely her personal opinion. She added that the regime's leadership still has no plans to repair relations with Japan and that it remains to be seen what Kishida's intentions are in the future. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Some interesting tech news that shook the world tonight. Artificial intelligence leader OpenAI introduced a new AI model called Sora, which it claims can create realistic and imaginative 60-second videos from quick text prompts. In a blog post, the company said Sora is capable of generating videos up to 60 seconds in length from text instructions, with the ability to serve up scenes with multiple characters, specific types of motion, and detailed background details. OpenAI said it intends to train the AI model so it can help help people solve problems that require real-world interaction. This is the latest effort from the company behind the viral chatbot ChatGPT, which continues to push the generative AI movement forward. Although multimodal models are not new and text-to-video models already exist, what sets this apart is the length and accuracy that OpenAI claims Sora to have. These types of AI models could have a big impact on digital entertainment markets with new personalized content being streamed across channels. And finally tonight, even though we just passed Valentine's Day, love is still in the air as Filipino pet lovers went on dates with rescued animals to celebrate Valentine's Day at an animal shelter in Manila to show them affection and also to promote pet adoption. The Philippine Animal Welfare Society, or PAWS as it's called, the animal shelter held its first date event where visitors mingled with some of its rescued dogs and cats inside themed booths. Visitors and animals were given snacks in exchange for donations to the shelter. Paws campaign officer Sharon Rapp said that 90% of the animals at the shelter were saved from cruelty and neglect. Yap added that the activity helps dismiss the image of the dangerous and aggressive shelter animals and hope the spirit of Valentine's would encourage Filipinos to adopt rather than buy pets. What a lovely first date. Well, that's all the stories we have for you this Friday night, wrapping up the week. We'll see you again on Monday with more updates on the happenings of the world. See you next time. Happy weekend.